An unbelievable tournament, unbelievable title game, and congrats to the Kansas Jayhawks. I feel like I've always had a little bit of a soft spot for the Jayhawks uh, going back to that Manning team that wasn't great around him. I think they were a big concern, too, was that they, they weren't going to make enough free throws, and, and Manning just carried them to a great title. And that was also because in 86, it felt like they had a really good team. Archie Marshall tore up his knee. Uh, this is going deep. This is kind of the beginning of my first not liking Duke experience. It went on pretty strong there for a long time. And then being around ESPN, it kind of uh, dissipated a little bit. But anyway, um, one of those games where you're like, I love this tournament and I love college basketball, even though I don't talk about college basketball a lot. And I'm going to get to that at the very end of this. But at half, let's do a little game stuff, your little game recap. Um, UNC is up 40 to 25. Felt like all the momentum, you know, you wondered, okay, wait, does Duke, is that too emotional? Is that where you pick Kansas in this one? But the other thing with Kansas is kind of funny too, is that if you really look at all the Bill Self teams, and we were talking about all the top seeds before the tournament even started, historically, this was not a really talented Kansas team. They won a lot of games. They win the Big 12. It feels like even when they're not supposed to win the Big 12, they win the Big 12 regular season and conference tournament uh, this year as well. Abaji's a pro. Brown, I guess, is a pro. But you know, they could actually not have one single lottery pick on this entire team, which isn't to say that that's the end all be all of all of this. But when you look at just sheer talent, hell, look at Duke. It's not like they had a disappointing season with getting into the final four, but they have five first round picks on that team. So it's not exactly the same template here for for uh, for talent. But UNC on the other side, too, is a weird team, right? I mean, UNC was 12 and six at one point. Um, they had beaten number 24 Michigan, but a handful of the other ranked teams that they played, they got their asses kicked. And then they went 12-3 and three to finish the season. They beat Kay in his final game at Cameron. They, we know what happened on Saturday night. So they were different profile teams, even though UNC had the lower seed and Kansas had the higher seed. UNC being up 40-25 at the half, I'm like, all right, I think I like them a little bit because of the momentum part of it. But I don't look at the Tar Heels as this incredibly talented basketball team either. I mean, if we go pros and start talking about that, like, I, I don't know who's going in the first round out of that entire roster. I don't know. Maybe somebody falls in love with Caleb Love. Maybe Baycott ends up becoming somebody late first. You know, I don't know. Like, the point is, is that this was not loaded with lottery picks all over the place. So as UNC is up, Kansas comes right out of the second half. They start getting into the paint a little bit more, um, going at the lack of size for North Carolina. Because even Manic, who's a big kid, the white kid from Oklahoma who transferred, um, it's not exactly something you think is going to hold up defensively. Uh, there's another part of this where the way it plays out with UNC losing where a lot of people were saying, well, look at UNC. They only played six guys. Kansas kind of only played six guys. I mean, Remy Martin comes in, the transfer from Arizona State, who scored a million points at Arizona State. He hit a bunch of shots. I thought like three of them were atrocious decisions and they went in. And he can't really even play point guard all that much. And yet they were playing him a decent amount. But other than that, Lightfoot played seven minutes and then another guy played two and another guy played three. So you could argue Kansas played four, four guys off the bench, but they really only played Remy. And on the other side, North Carolina played Puff Johnson, who's Cam Johnson's younger brother, which makes sense because you're watching him going, he looks a lot like the guy in the Phoenix Suns who also played for the Tar Heels. So I'm not quite sure if that's what it was. I don't know that it was because of the emotional part of Duke on Saturday that they couldn't overcome it and that they just ran out of gas in the second half. It's a really easy thing to say. I hear it said all the time. Maybe I'm wrong, but if you're looking at Baycott's injury, the ankle at the very end, he'd already rolled it. He'd already rolled it, so that was there. Manic, I think, on that last play, that was supposed to be him in the corner. I think they were going to try to throw it to him in the corner, and he stumbled along the baseline. Is it because he was tired because of how exhausting Duke was, or is it because he got smashed in the face? Where I was surprised he was even still playing. He looked like he was out of it there for a little while and then got hit again. Or maybe he just slipped. And as far as Puff Johnson out there, who at one point I thought, is he throwing up on the court? Uh, they had said somebody had hit him, but I didn't really see that replay correctly. And Puff at one point looked like he was actually going to save this team. And he's not exactly a guy you expect a ton from because of the way he played. So as we're looking at how the rest of the game played out, I don't know that North Carolina was still drained from Saturday. I don't know. It's because they had a short rotation. I don't think Kansas played a ton of guys. Or we could look at each individual act and say, well, there's an explanation beyond just what happened on Saturday. Uh, When Kansas goes up, North Carolina's coming down. And if you know anything about the Caleb Love story, and I'm sure you saw him hit just an absurd amount of big shots against Duke, um, it's a little bit, I'm trying to think. Like, I have a theory, a working theory here. Trey Young, stop me if you've heard this before. I wonder 
And even though they started winning games here again, I wonder if the Eastern Conference Finals appearance ends up becoming a bad thing for the Hawks because it emboldens Trey to be like, no, no, this is how we do it. And this is how I'm going to do it. And this is the best chance that we have. And you're like, eh, maybe, maybe. Because why, why are you so average this year, right? Maybe they turn it on. Maybe the playoff run. Who knows? Okay, fine. Caleb Love is somebody who, if you go back to last year when Roy Williams was still the coach, and he was a five-star recruit out of St. Louis, big deal. And he's turning the ball over a ton, and he's not hitting any shots. And they were asking Roy, I was reading this article the other day, and they were asking Roy Williams about Caleb Love, and they're like, what do you think? And Roy had a great answer. He goes, you know, he's going to be a really good player. He's like, I just like it to be before I die. And that's a coach telling you, and as you watched him, this is, this is a frustrating player. And he had the turnovers last night. But I knew because he took that shot against Duke and hit it, I'm like, he is going to take the shot again. I wrote it down in my notes before it happened. I said, Caleb Love will pull this up from deep because he's going to be that guy. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this shot. Because he just hit it against Duke. So you kind of want to say, all right, I love the confidence. I love that you believe in yourself. Maybe you don't need one from 30 feet with 15 left on the shot clock. That was the most predictable shot I've watched in the entire tournament. Wasn't even close. And then Kansas has the ball. Maybe this will be forgotten. We probably remember the next day. But Kansas inbounding the basketball and the guy stepping out of bounds twice while he's about to be fouled up three with only four and a half seconds left. If that had turned the ball over, ends up going to overtime, North Carolina scores. They, you know, Kansas losing overtime. If I were a Kansas fan, I would have needed a year off, a straight up, just a year off. I can't root. Like, I just emotionally, we need some space for a little while because it'll be lost historically. But to be up three with the ball, four and a half seconds left, and the guy who receives the inbounds steps out of bounds would have been one of the all time ways to let another team back in and lose a game, which is ironic too, because Self's only other title was when Memphis just stopped hitting free throws, what, up nine with two-something minutes to go, Chalmers shot, and that's Self's only title previous to this, which is also something that's worth talking about because when you think about how hard it is to win in this tournament and all the great teams that Self has had where, you know, the Bucknell loss, like I was going through it again this morning, and it happens to all of these, all of these big-time, because you're around long enough you're going to have a couple early exits that make no sense whatsoever because it's still sports and it's one and done and maybe it's just not your day. And Self in his 19th season gets his second title. But think of that. Like this had been, what, a decade and a half? Well, 2008. All right, so almost there. Yeah, we're talking 14 years since his last title in that Memphis comeback. And Self is one of the best coaches going. But when you start thinking about who are, not the Mount Rushmore, but who are the guys, right? Who are the guys at their place that have done it the longest, that are considered among the best? Izzo's had one at Michigan State. I'd argue the Michigan State talent has fallen off a little bit in recent years. But Izzo, who's a terrific coach by any standard, has won. And it was over 20 years ago. I don't know if I put Bayheim in there. He's been at Syracuse 40 years. I don't think Bayheim gets included in the self-Calipari Coach K conversation but he's been with Syracuse that long. He's got one. Cal, speaking of, I mean, Cal's been at Kentucky now um, 13 years, I think. Yeah, 13 years. He's got one. He's zero Final Fours in the last seven years. So it's a bit of a warning, too, to fan bases where I always like to say, no matter which college football program you are, what your history is, you start seeing those banners in stadiums. You go, man, there are some gaps in between. What if you told LSU fans, be like, yeah, it was a nice run in 2019. It's going to be 20 years before you win another one. I mean, that seems ridiculous in the moment, but that's exactly how this plays out. I mean, that's, that's always the point that I, it is really hard. It is really hard to do this. That's why the saving thing is so stupid. We'll probably appreciate it more years removed from it happening because now we're numb to it, right? It is really hard to win. 